Hi, Sarah. Oops. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing? Yes, good, thank you. Cool. Hopefully looking less red. So I did a uh, PowerPoint thing. I didn't know if you wanted it. <laughs> it's, it's so complicated at work, like genuinely. Um, yeah, okay. It's all right. I'll come out of that. Okay. So I'm obviously not going to share my screen or anything this time. I'm just going to facilitate you in the background with questions and stuff. Uh, Is that okay? <laughs> Is that okay with you, or what? Do, uh, what you tell, tell me what you want me to do. Yes, I think so. I'm just opening your. Let's see if I can make you a co make a host. There you go. Yeah, and then I'll make okay. the others a host as they come in. Mm -hmm. So all I've done so far is um, um, mute everybody on entry. Okay. So can you share your screen, I guess? I'm just going to try to print something um, and then... I will I've got to open the thing first. Um, I have to say I'm not thoroughly prepared for this really. It's uh, all right. Been running around in the lab like crazy. We had a uh -huh. chiller breakdown last week. The the building like chilled water broke down last week. Wow. Um, so I just I've lost the um I lost the waiting room <laughs> at the minute. Um, I can see there are four people. It tells me there's four people waiting. Okay, I lost. I lost that when I made you co-host. Uh, no, you've made me the host. Ah, oh, that might be it then. Sorry, Make that, that's why I've lost host. it. So if you want to, yes. Okay, cool. Then I can let people in and out the rooms. You don't need to worry about that. I'll admit all, right. all once we're all in the room. I've also, is it recording again? I pull. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we still have a few more people coming in uh, through the waiting room. Um, so we'll just give it another minute or two just to get everybody in. But first of all, thank you for, for joining us today. And it's just started raining here in Teddington. So it's a beautiful, uh, British summer's afternoon. Um, hopefully things are looking nicer wherever you are today. Um, um, but yes, thank you very much for, for joining us all um, today. Uh, my name's Sarah Hill and I'm the chair of the Atomic Spectroscopy Group from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce the, the fourth in our series of virtual meetings, so the A to Z of atomic spectroscopy. So we're only four in, still a little way to go. Um, but I'm really excited for today's event. D is for development. And we have um, four fantastic speakers um, here today to um, present their work regarding the latest developments with um, atomic spectroscopy and covering quite a wide range of topics and, and applications. Um, I would just firstly like to say this is my first attempt at hosting a webinar um, and it's also our first attempt using Zoom as well. So um, apologies if there are any problems or any issues, um, this will be entirely my fault, I'm sorry. Um, so I apologize in advance. Um, so I think um, we're just two minutes past now. So in that case, I will um, just kind of introduce the meeting in that um, the format of the meeting uh, is we will have our four presenters um, speak over the next hour and a bit, and uh, we'll collate the questions and have a, a question and discussion session at the end. So please do use the, the chat function to send questions. You can either send them um, publicly to all, or if you just want to send it to the host, um, just send it to the account that's called network meetings at rsc.org. It should also have a little host sign next to it as well. And that will just go privately to um, the host 
and we'll collate those questions at the end um, and hopefully have a, a nice discussion. So the first on our agenda today is um, Dr. Eduardo Bolia Fernandez, who's uh, currently a, a postdoc researcher at um, Ghent University in Belgium. Eduardo um, obtained his bachelor and master's degree in chemistry from the University of Saragossa before moving to Ghent to, to carry out his PhD work. Um, now as a postdoc researcher, um, He's, his work is focused on the uh, ultra trace elemental and isotopic analysis using tandem ICPMS mass spectrometry. So today um, he will be giving um, a presentation with, uh, entitled the detection of micro microplastics using ICPMS operated in single event mode. So um, I will pass the screen over to you and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your uh, kind introduction. I'm going to try to share my uh, screen. Okay, I hope it works. Yep, looking great, fantastic, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. So thanks again for your uh, Kind uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my presentation of today um, is about, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially uh, Jackie and Sarah, for inviting me to participate in this uh, atomic spectroscopy group uh, virtual symposium, which is entitled uh, D is for uh, development. And the development for me in this case is about the characterization or the detection of microplastics using ICP mass spectrometry operated in single event mode. This is actually, this is actually a topic we have been actively working on uh, within the Atomic and Mass Spectrometry Research Unit at Ghent University over the last uh, two years, uh, and a topic in which we are still uh, actively working on at the moment. The ANMS Research Unit is specialized in the development of methods for the determination elemental speciation and isotope analysis of trace metal and metalloids via ICPMS, and we apply all those methods in interdisciplinary context. You can see the key word that defines uh, the activities that we are currently uh, doing within the atomic and mass spectrometry research unit is development, so this fits quite well with the topic of this virtual uh, event. So these are uh, some of uh, these uh, a summary of the different research lines we have within uh, ANMS uh, that we can that I would like to summarize in uh, isotopic analysis in uh, various contexts, such as for instance uh, biomedicine uh, or environmental uh, applications. But we also have some uh, geo and cosmochemical applications, and we also measure isotope ratio isotope ratios for uh, provenance uh, determination. We also have active research line in the context of uh, elemental speciation. Uh, especially in collaboration with uh, the pharma companies. We also have a quite a strong uh, research line uh, in the context of direct analysis of uh, solid samples, uh, solid samples by means of uh, laser relation as a means of sample uh, introduction. We actually have a state-of-the-art uh, laser relation uh, ICPMS instrumentation uh, with high uh, sample throughput and with the capability of obtaining high-resolution images with uh, pixels of approximately one micrometer or even lower. And we apply this laser ablation ICPMS technique for biomedical and also geo and cosmochemical applications. But in today's lecture, I would like to talk about single event uh, ICPMS, which is a topic for which we have uh, been uh, expending quite a lot of time over the last five or six years. And we use single event ICPMS for both environmental and biomedical uh, applications. First of all, why ICP mass spectrometry? Um, well, uh, as you probably know, ICP mass spectrometry is one of the most powerful techniques uh, for ultra trace elemental and isotopic analysis due to a large number of advantages uh, over other analytical techniques. So here you can see the advantages of uh, ICP mass spectrometry, such as, for instance, the low limits of detection uh, attainable within, for instance, the nanogram per liter uh, approximately. Uh, also, multi-element capabilities, which basically means that we can detect multiple uh, analytes within a single run. 
also a wide linear dynamic range. We can um, measure concentrations going from uh, the nanogram per liter to the uh, milligram per liter range or uh, even higher. A high sample throughput, uh, a relatively simple spectra, especially if we compare with other uh, atomic spectroscopy techniques. Uh, also, the ability to obtain isotopic information for those elements having more than one isotope. While also ICP mass spectrometry can be easily combined with alternative sample introduction systems, for instance, laser ablation for a direct analysis of solid samples, and chromatographic separation techniques, for instance, a high performance liquid chromatography. But today I would like to talk about the possibility to obtain fast temporal resolved information with ICP mass spectrometry. This is a type of information that has always been there, uh, but our detectors were just not um, fast enough to, uh, to, achieve, to, to obtain this uh, information. So now uh, instrument developments by different manufacturers, we have access to this fast temporal resolved information. And this is what we use in the context of single event ICP mass spectrometry. So with this slide and next one, I would like to show you the, the, the most important difference between traditional ICP mass spectrometry and single event ICPMS. In the case of traditional ICPMS, we mostly focus on homogeneous aqueous uh, suspensions. So basically our analyte is homogeneously distributed sample and we uh, aspirate this sample uh, into our ICPMS instrument. We have uh, different sample introduction systems, but normally traditional ones for uh, solution-based analysis. And then when our sample reaches the uh, plasma, which is uh, our ion source, then the sample is vaporized, atomized, and ionized. Uh, and the ions uh, go uh, in, into the mass analyzer, which in this case is a quadrupole mass filter. Uh, the mass analyzer separates the ions in function of their mass to charge uh, ratio so that only the selected mass to charge ratios are able uh, to uh, pass through the quadrupole or the mass analyzer and be detected in the detection system. So basically with uh, traditional ICP mass spectrometry, we get a signal that looks like uh, the one I am showing to you in this figure uh, at the bottom right uh, of this slide, in which, as you can see, we have a relatively uh, constant or continuous signal. So it doesn't matter which uh, integration time uh, we which all time we use uh, that we will, we will always obtain the same uh, intensity, in this case, the same intensity in counts per second. So basically this continuous signal represents the analyte which is uh, present in the solved form in, an, in the sample. The situation changes significantly when we are talking about single event ICP mass spectrometry. As in this case, we are not talking anymore about homogeneous aqueous suspension, but we are talking about heterogeneous suspension. As you can see here, we don't have an homogeneous suspension anymore, but we have some discrete entities um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the solution. Uh, so basically in this case, we need to be able to introduce these discrete, these discrete uh, entities, these uh, nano or micro uh, structures uh, into our ICPMS instruments. And for this, we have different uh, sample introduction systems uh, that I will use. I, I will show you the one that we used for microplastics uh, later on. So basically, in the case of single event ICPMS, we also have this background, this relatively constant background signal uh, that I've shown you before in the case of uh, traditional ICPMS uh, measurement. But additionally, every time that one of those uh, entities reaches the plasma, it forms a package of uh, ions or an ion cloud that goes through the quadruple mass filter and uh, is detected in the detector system at more or less the same uh, moment in time. And when this happens, we have uh, a high intense um, uh, pulse signal with a duration of approximately 300, 600 microseconds uh, under normal conditions. So basically, every of these pulses represents the absolute amount or the mass of that analyte in every of these discrete uh, entities. In this slide, I would like to so my single event ICP mass spectrometry, I would like to give you an overview about this, um, about this methodology uh, with an example for, uh, for an engineer nanoparticle. So in this case, I am talking about single particle ICP mass spectrometry. So in this case, we have a nanoparticle here uh, that goes uh, inside of the ICP. Then this nanoparticle is uh, vaporized, atomized, and ionized. And here we have the ion cloud coming from this nanoparticle. So this ion cloud represents uh, the nanoparticle. Um, 
after uh, this um, package of ions uh, is uh, detected, then this leads to a time resolved signal that looks like figure B. So here you can see that we have multiple signal spikes. Uh, each of the signal spikes corresponds with uh, one nanoparticle. Uh, here, as you can see here in blue, uh, normally the duration of these uh, events created by nanoparticles are of approximately 400 microseconds. By means of an appropriate uh, data treatment, we can very easily convert this time resolved signal into a frequency versus signal or integrated signal intensity uh, distributions, where here you can see the distribution for the nanoparticles fully separated in this case uh, to, the, um, to the background uh, distribution. By means of an appropriate calibration, which basically needs to account for uh, a calculation of the transport efficiency um, and also uh, a calibration of the instrument sensitivity by using uh, ionic uh, calibration solutions. Uh, we can uh, convert this uh, frequency versus signal distribution into a frequency versus size distribution in the case of engineer nanoparticles. Of course, we need a number of assumptions, such as, for instance, the nanoparticles are uh, perfect spheres, and also we assume the density and uh, some other uh, aspects. But here you can see the information that we can obtain in case of, uh, sorry, in the case of a single particle ICP mass spectrometry. So we have a nanoparticle of 70 nanometers, but we also get information about the amount dispersity of those uh, nanoparticles. So this is a summary of the information that we can obtain using single event ICP mass spectrometry. So in addition to the information about the presence of the analyte in the salt form in our sample, which we obtain uh, basically uh, from the background signal, we can additionally, uh, additionally obtain a number-based concentration which is basically the number of entities, the number of micro or nano objects that we have in solution, uh, also the mass concentration in nanorans per liter, and finally, the mass of each of these individual entities, and in the case of single particle ICPMS, also the size determination after a number of assumptions. So we use all this information in different uh, contexts or for different uh, applications, uh, such as for instance, single particle ICP mass spectrometry for the characterization of engineer nanoparticles. Single particle ICPMS was actually introduced in 2003 by Degrader uh, and others, uh, but it was only after 2010 with works, for instance, like the one of uh, Laborda and others, uh, that, this, um, that this methodology started to grow uh, exponentially. And nowadays, single particle ICPMS is almost used as a, as a routine uh, approach in most laboratories dealing with the characterization of nanoparticles. Over the last years, especially over the last five years, we have realized that with um, little changes, we can apply the single particle ICPMS methodology for the analysis of individual cells. So this is what we call single cell ICP mass spectrometry. And ICPMS can be used, for instance, in the context of uh, metallograph studies for, uh, for instance, a classical example is the, uh, the study of cisplatin as a chemotherapeutic drug in which we use platinum as an ICPMS detectable element. But single cell ICPMS can also be used, for instance, uh, for, the, uh, for the determination of endogenous elements that are uh, inherently present in the cells uh, to exert its biological functions. In between single particle ICPMS and single cell ICPMS, we thought that there was an opportunity for us to characterize also uh, micro and potentially maybe nanoplastics using a similar approach, single event ICP mass spectrometry. The most important, of course, all of you know the exceptional properties of plastics, uh, and that's why they are widely used materials uh, nowadays. Of course, this massive use of uh, plastics has triggered an increased global uh, production that unfortunately also comes together with a significant accumulation of plastic waste uh, in the environment. Actually, if you look at this figure, uh, there is a prediction indicating that the amount of plastic waste uh, will increase by a factor of five in the next 30 years. So there is a need to develop analytical methods for the appropriate characterization of micro and nanoplastics. And there are, of course, different techniques that uh, have already been used for the characterization of microplastics. Here you have uh, a number of examples, for instance, Raman microscopy or traditional transmission or scanning electron uh, microscopy. But all of these, uh, all of these techniques, uh, sorry, uh, all, of, all of these techniques uh, have uh, a limitation, at least when we have been talking with uh, experts in the field of microplastics characterization. 
And this is the problem when dealing with uh, microplastics particles in the low micrometer size, in the low micrometer size, and also for the nanoplastics. So then we were wondering about the possibilities of using ICT mass spectrometry uh, in the context of microplastics characterization. Of course, uh, for this to happen, we need to uh, deal with the measurement of carbon by using ICP mass spectrometry. Uh, and as probably most of you know, uh, carbon is typically one of the elements that we consider as non-measurable using ICPMS. This is because of a number of associated challenges, such as, for instance, the low ionization efficiency, which is of approximately 1% to 5%. So basically, this means uh, that carbon is poorly ionized in uh, argon-based uh, plasmas. And also, uh, we have a really high background coming from dissolved uh, carbon dioxide and also other carbon species that are ubiquitously present um, in the case of ICPMS analysis. So you need to, of course, uh, don't forget that the ICP part of an ICPMS uh, instrument is located at atmospheric pressure and it's in contact with uh, all the gases that we have in the atmosphere. So we have a lot of uh, carbon-based uh, gases and we also have uh, some carbon compounds that are uh, present as contaminants in the argon that we use uh, to generate the plasma and to introduce our samples. Also, in the case of microplastics, we have to deal with an additional challenge, which is the introduction of relatively large and hard particulate material. So taking all these challenges into account, then we were wondering about the possibilities to reach microplastics via ICPMS. So we asked our three questions to ourselves, are micro and nanoplastics detectable using ICP mass spectrometry? Could this detection be based on their carbon content? Because of course, this would be the most uh, direct and straightforward approach, but of course, with, with also with a number of challenges. And in addition to only detection, is it also possible to characterize uh, these microplastics? So to obtain additional information instead of only uh, counting them or detecting the presence of those microplastics in sample. We found or we thought that there was uh, that there would be an opportunity when operating an ICPMS instrument in single event mode, as in this case when we when we work with ultra fast dual times in the order of approximately 100 microseconds or uh, perhaps even lower, we can minimize the background intensity generated by uh, the high uh, carbon uh, contamination within its time window, while at the same time we are preserving the intensity for individual signal spike obtained when a microplastic reaches the ICP. So basically we, basically we want to decrease the background signal uh, coming from CO2 and other carbon species while we keep uh, constant, where we preserve the intensity every time that a microplastic reaches the ICP and is detected in the detection system. So taking all of this into consideration, we designed our instrument as a tab, which was based on the use of an Agilent 17900 uh, ICPMS instrument at the lowest possible dual time of 100 microseconds. We use the single nanoparticle analysis module of the Agile Mass Hunter workstation software for uh, data acquisition and data treatment. Uh, we also used a silence driven MVX 7100 microliter workstation that you can see here uh, that allowed us to uh, introduce solution at highly stable and extremely low liquid flow rates. So actually for this work, we only uh, use 25 microliters of uh, sample solution microliters per minute. So this is extremely low compared with traditional ICPMS instrumentation, uh, typically working at 200 or 400 microliters per minute. And we had to do so as otherwise the background uh, intensity of uh, other carbon species would be extremely high and we would not be able to distinguish uh, the spikes uh, created by uh, individual microplastics. Furthermore, we use a special glass function glassware, which was originally designed for high sensitivity, single cell uh, that you can actually see here. And these are uh, some of these types of uh, total sample consumption introduction systems or high efficiency uh, sample introduction systems that are used to introduce relatively large discrete uh, entities. You also need to take into account that if uh, we would like, if we, if we would use traditional sample introduction system, those are designs for uh, removing uh, the largest droplets. So actually droplets of uh, approximately five to 10 micrometers in size. So these traditional sample introduction systems, uh, microplastics, microplastics would be discriminated together with the biggest droplets. 
course for meta development, we had to use some standards. And in this case, uh, we try to find a standard that contains, in addition to carbon, an element that can be more easily detected using ICP mass spectrometry. And in this case, we found uh, 2.5 micrometer polystyrene beads uh, that are uh, doped with some uh, lanthanide elements, for instance, holmium. And those are uh, polymer beads that are typically used in the context of uh, calibration from mass cytometry. We also use um, both uh, polymeric particles, also polystyrene particles, uh, with a mean diameter of approximately one micrometer for metal development. So basically, we wanted to, um, to answer all our questions. We wanted to see if it would be possible to uh, obtain uh, the particle number density, so the number base concentration, which means the number of particles, in this case, the number of microplastics uh, per unit of volume, in this case, particles per milliliter, uh, by knowing the number of events or the number of spikes uh, detected. We also wanted to know if it would be possible to get some additional information from the intensity of those uh, individual uh, spikes. So first, we focus on the number of spikes and the calculation of the uh, particle number density or the number base concentration. And for this, we compare the results obtained when monitoring 13 carbon. Uh, we selected 13 carbon because uh, 12 carbon, which is the most abundant carbon isotope, uh, was considered a bit uh, risky for uh, the detector of our ICPMS instrument. So we decided to go uh, for the lowest uh, abundant carbon uh, isotope. And we compare the results obtained, the number of spikes detected when monitoring exactly the same, the same, dilution, the same solution, uh, but monitoring holmium because these uh, 2.5 micrometer polystyrene microspheres uh, are the elements. So they also contain holmium in addition to carbon. And we compare three different dilution factors. We perform three replicates uh, for each dilution factor when monitoring both carbon and holmium. And as you can see here in this table, in all cases, our results were in perfect agreement. Uh, our results of the number of polystyrene microspheres detected were perfectly in good agreement when monitoring both 13 carbon and 165 holmium. So basically, this means for the first time, we could demonstrate that it was possible to detect and to count uh, microplastics using ICP mass spectrometry by means of a direct approach uh, monitoring the carbon content of these uh, microplastics. Of course, we also want to see whether the intensity addition provides additional uh, information. So here you can see uh, the results obtained for the 2.5 micrometer polystyrene microspheres uh, by relying on the carbon monitoring compared with uh, results obtained for the one micrometer polystyrene microspheres. You can very easily notice that in the case of 2.5, uh, the distribution is fully separated from that of the background, or yeah, there is almost no overlap. While in the case of one micrometer, uh, the distribution uh, partly overlaps with that of the background. And still, it was possible for us to get the most frequent uh, integrated intensity in both cases. And of course, if uh, this approach works, uh, the uh, ratio between the most frequent intensities of 2.5 and 1 micrometer uh, should be for uh, polystyrene, so for the same type of polymer with the same density and with the same amount of carbon atoms in the molecule should be proportional to the size of these uh, polystyrene microspheres. If we look uh, at the ratio between uh, the volume of a 2.5 and 1 micrometer particles, this theoretical ratio is 15.62 and our experimental ratio of both most frequent integrated intensities was found to be in, in really good agreement with the theoretical ratio only focusing on uh, the volume of those uh, microspheres. So this also demonstrated for the first time that we can not only uh, detect these uh, microplastics and count them, but we can also provide uh, size uh, information about the size of these uh, microplastics. So some of these, uh, some, some uh, conclusions or take home uh, messages uh, for the first time, uh, we could detect uh, plastics using ICP mass spectrometry operated in single event mode by the monitoring of their carbon uh, content. In this case, monitoring the isotope uh, of carbon uh, 13. A very, very good agreement was found between the number based concentration values determined uh, by monitoring carbon and those uh, relying on the monitoring of 165 holmium for uh, microplastics uh, doped with uh, lanthanide uh, elements. The theoretical ratio that we calculated based on the difference in differences in volume between the two 
uh, polymeric uh, microspheres was found to be in very good agreement with that cal calculated using the most frequently occurring integrated intensities using ICPMS operated in single event mode. And these results basically suggest that this technique shows promising features for the detection, quantification, and size characterization of uh, microplastics. There are also some uh, future perspectives for uh, the development of this method. So uh, at, at ANMS, we demonstrated in last year uh, that ICPMS has potential for uh, the characterization of microplastics, and we are still uh, working actively on the improvement of this uh, method. But also, uh, this pioneering work has been followed up by another one from Laborda and others, uh, confirming the potential of uh, this technique for studying the particle size of polystyrene microspheres up to five micrometers. So while we focus on one and 2.5 uh, in this work, also microparticles of five micrometers were measured. In a recent work from a few uh, months ago, uh, Gonzalo de Vega and others explored the possibilities of using tandem ICP mass spectrometry for monitoring 12 carbon instead of 13 carbon. And they report the size detection limit of 0 0.62 micrometers, uh, which are actually in the uh, nanoplastic range and not in the microplastic uh, range. So you have to also realize that for microplastics, uh, nanoplastics are those, those plastic particles with uh, sizes lower than one micrometer. So this definition is slightly different compared to the one of any nanoparticles. Also, the authors discuss uh, that matrix effects would need to be corrected by uh, matrix matching uh, in the case of characterization of microplastics in uh, seawater. Furthermore, I would also like to mention that in, a, in, in, uh, in addition to some direct approaches, uh, like the ones that I've mentioned uh, up to now, uh, focusing on the monitoring of carbon. Also, some indir indirect approaches have been used uh, by using some uh, metal tags. And in this context, Lamana and others detected polystyrene particles uh, conjugated with functionalized gold nanoparticles. So basically, they monitored gold uh, for the detection of uh, microplastics, micro and nanoplastics. Uh, and although this approach so far only provided number based concentration, uh, they report a size detection limit of 165 nanometer. So uh, I would like to include this by saying that overall, this is a new field for which a fast development uh, can already be anticipated. Thank uh, some of our uh, sponsors uh, for the loan of uh, instrumentation, Teledyne, uh, Tetac Technologies, uh, Glass Expansion uh, and Island Technologies. Also, uh, I would like to thank FWO for my personal grant. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Institute of Environmental Research uh, as we perform this work in collaboration with them. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I would, uh, that was really interesting and nice to see um, something different being done with ICPMS, in particular the, the carbon um, analysis. Um, I would also just like to say thank you very much as well for, for taking the time from your personal holiday as well to, to join us today. So thank you very no much, problem. Eduardo. No okay. um, we'll be hosting um, some questions and discussion um, at the end of the session. So we will yeah. now move Perfect. on to our second speaker. Yeah. Uh, so that's okay. Dr. Amy Manor from, the, from Yalapara University. And uh, Amy is a lecturer in chemistry at the university and her research is focused on the development of laser ablation and ICPMS technology with its application to biological and geological research. Um, today, she's going to be talking to us um, also using ICPMS, but for a, a, a very unusual type of sample as well. So looking at asbestos. So um, thank you very much for joining us today, Amy, and I'll pass over to you. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, you're all loaded up and ready to go. Great, thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about some work that we did in mesothelioma research. Uh, this was a collaboration between uh, Loughborough University and Sheffield Hallam University, who've done a lot of work into mesothelioma research in the past. Um, we also worked with industry as well, in this case, new instruments. So I should before I start, I should really thank the two PhD students that did a lot of the work that I'll be presenting today. Uh, and those are Callum Greenhouse and Oana Valaraka. Um, Oana's from Sheffield Helm. 
So why do we want to do this research? Why are we interested in looking at asbestos? Well, asbestos is implicated in the development of malignant mesothelioma, and this is a very aggressive type of cancer. Um, and it's associated with exposure to asbestos. One of the really quite distressing things about mesothelioma is that it's got a very poor prognosis. It's often diagnosed at a very late stage and actually the median survival time from diagnosis is around six to 12 months. So what we really want to be able to do is detect this condition earlier um, in order to offer better treatment. Although the link with uh, asbestos is very well known, there's still a lot of information that we're missing there. And um, one of the things that we still don't know is exactly how much exposure to asbestos you have to have before you'll go on to develop mesothelioma. And in fact, some people will be exposed and will never develop the condition, um, whereas some other people may be more predisposed to getting mesothelioma after being exposed to asbestos. So there needs to be a lot more research into this condition. But the research itself is quite challenging because trying to find these fibres, they're like thin needles. Uh, I said needles in haystacks in my title. Trying to find these very thin needles within the sample is very difficult. Uh, certainly if you're using microscopic techniques, your ability to see them can quite often be dependent on the orientation of the fibre within the tissue. So we need to think about other methods and whether there's any newer methods that we can use to detect these fibres within tissue samples. The fibres themselves contain silicon and a variety of other metals that we can detect using ICPMS. Um, and you can see in the table that I've put on this slide here that we've got calcium, magnesium, iron, uh, as well as silicon. So many different things that we could try and detect. So can we actually detect these fibres based purely on their elemental profile by using ICPMS? And this is an overview of the methodology that we used. We wanted to look at the fibres amongst a biological background. It would have been hard to start out by looking at fibres embedded within tissues though, because you can't actually see the fibres when they're deeply embedded within the tissue. So we started out by just using cultured cells. These were human mesothelioma cells and they were cultured and spiked with three micrograms per mil of asbestos. Those suspensions were then cytospun and plated onto glass or plastic microscope slides for analysis. We then used laser ablation to image those fibres now, I know most people attending this webinar will be very familiar with the ICPMS side, but not everybody will have come across laser ablation before. So I'm briefly going to just describe what you can see on the slide here. We have a chamber containing our sample, which is shown in black. A focused laser beam will pass through into this chamber. It will strike our sample and it will generate a plume of ablated material which gets swept on into our ICPMS. The title of this webinar series is D is for Development, and there's been actually quite a lot of development around um, this area of the laser ablation chamber. When I started working in the field, the chamber looked a bit like this, just a plain box. And then gradually we moved towards what's known as two volume designs. These two volume designs use an inner chamber, which you can see here, to help more efficiently capture that ablated material and transmit it towards the ICPMS. Following on from that, there have also been developments in the aerosol transport as it reaches the plasma. What I'm showing on this slide is what's known as a dual concentric injector. This was something that we developed at Loughborough University. And the aim of this is to minimize dispersion of that material as it passes through into the plasma. So by putting our material straight through into the central channel of the plasma and sheathing it with an argon gas, we can stop this kind of turbulent mixing of the flows. And in doing so, we're able to get a much faster signal response as well as higher sensitivity by doing that. 
And as well as this design here, the DCI, there's been a lot of work by other universities as well. And the net result of that is that maybe 10 years ago, it would be about a second for your material to pass from your laser ablation chamber into your plasma. Now there's many, many different groups that are reporting peak washouts of around one to two milliseconds. So there's been a dramatic development of the interface between the laser ablation and the ICP. Because of this increased sensitivity and speed, um, we're able to change the way that we do the laser ablation. We've been using a three micrometer spot size, a 50 hertz repetition rate and 150 micron per second scan speed. This means that we were able to sample a new location on the sample surface with every laser shot. So we weren't using overlapping craters here. We were actually able to ensure that every time the laser fired that generated a pixel in our final image. And moving on to the ICPMS step, a lot of our preliminary work was done using sector field technology, um, but we found very quickly that that wasn't really adequate for this application. So we moved on to using a time of flight mass spectrometer, the VITES from New Instruments. What this allows us to do is to measure from sodium through to uranium in 25.5 microseconds. So very rapid scanning of the whole mass range really. 40 of these consecutive scans were summed together to give us data points at one millisecond intervals, which you can see on the data on the bottom of the slide. And you can see that at 50 Hertz, our peaks are resolved from each other. We were getting about 10 millisecond washouts within this data. You can also see in green here, we've got some vertical lines coming down. These were the trigger signals that we got. So every time the laser fired, we sent a trigger signal to our mass spectrometer. And when we came to do the data processing, what we did is we summed between each of these trigger signals to give us one pixel in our final image. So as I said, every laser shot is one peak and then every peak was then converted into a pixel in the final image. The data from the TOF can be outputted to a variety of different software packages. For this work, we actually use some in-house software that we developed at Loughborough, the LA ICPMS image tool. And this program is freely available to anyone that wants it. So if anyone's interested in the processing, please do get in touch and I can give you a link to where you can download that. We were able to correlate our ICPMS images to our microscopic images using endogenous elements that are present within the cells. So for example, sodium here, you can see that our cells contain large amounts of sodium. So we're able to use that to overlay onto our microscopic images and see where everything is within the sample. Now, I mentioned that our preliminary work involved sector field technology. Uh, sector field instrumentation is what we've got at Loughborough University. So all of our kind of method development work was done on that. We took some positives from this method development work. And the first positive was that we can actually see the fibers within the sample. We are able to get sufficient spatial resolution to see these tiny fibers, which you can see outlined here in our microscopic image. And you can see here that we're able to measure um, magnesium, phosphorus and silicon, and we're able to see clear signals from those fibers. So this was a positive to the work. The downside that the sector field technology has, though, is that magnetic scanning is very slow. So when you're working with transient signals from laser ablation uh, systems, it's not really the most appropriate technology to use. You can use a fast scan mode, which will allow you to jump quickly between masses using electric scanning. Um, and we're able, as you see here, to measure three different things at once. However, that does come at the expense of a restricted mass range, which meant that we weren't able to measure elements like calcium and iron, which are actually really important to measure uh, within these fibers. 
So we realized quite quickly that we would have to switch to using time of flight technology in order to pseudo simultaneously measure many different elements. And we looked at three types of asbestos fiber. These are crocodilite, amosite, and actinolite, and a non-asbestos control fiber, uh, which is wollastonite on the left-hand side here. For each one of these, we imaged a 400 by 200 micron area. And I'm showing here the potassium signals within those ranges. The potassium signals were very helpful in allowing us to overlay our data onto the microscopic images. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of potassium within the fibers themselves. So what I've done here is I've outlined the locations where the fibers would be um, in a white ring here. I'm now showing the silicon data. We measured 28 silicon. I should say that the time of flight system that we used here has an always on collision reaction cell, which means that we're able to reduce um, or remove nitrogen and argon based interferences. So we were able to measure 28 silicon here. There's a high proportion of silicon within the wollastonite fibers, over 40% of its nominal composition is silicon. So we can see a very strong signal in our wollastonite fiber here. It's also present in the other three fiber types as well though. So you can see everywhere where there's a fiber, we see a strong silicon signal. Silicon is not necessarily that good then at distinguishing between the different fiber types. So if we have a look at magnesium now, 20% of the nominal composition of amosite is magnesium. So we see very strong signals for the fibers in our amosite image. Magnesium is also present in actinolite as well. So as expected, we see strong signal here. It's not expected to be present in wollastonite. We don't see much magnesium there. Rather surprisingly though, we did see magnesium within crocodilite, even though it isn't within its nominal composition. Sometimes when you get asbestos fibers found in nature, they do, you do get other elements that have been substituted into their structure, um, which is what we think we're seeing here. So this was a little bit of an unexpected finding to find so much magnesium within the crocodilite sample. We then moved on to look at calcium. So this is an element that we weren't able to look at using the sector field technology. We see quite a large signal for wollastonite. Over 34% of the nominal composition of wollastonite is calcium. So this was unexpected, well, it was expected. 9% uh, of actinolite is calcium as well. So we see a strong signal there. And we didn't see any signals for the crocodilite and the amosite samples as we expected. So looking at calcium is able to distinguish these two fiber types here from the wollastonite and the actinolite. If we look at the iron data now, we see signals for crocodilite, amosite and actinolite. There's no iron that was found in our wollastonite sample. There is um, a little dot here that you can see in that sample. This was actually not a fiber, but a piece of cellular debris that was present on the slide there. So within the fiber region, we didn't see any iron signals there. So what you can probably see from this data is it's, in some cases, it's quite easy to visually from our images, see differences between the different fibers. Um, but particularly for the crocodilite and the amosite, distinguishing between these is more challenging. So we thought to ourselves, well, what could we use? Um, what better way could we use to represent this data and to see if there are differences between the fiber types? So we used principal components analysis for this. We looked at 10 different elements within the fibers. And these were based on known constituents of the fibers and also known elements that can substitute into the fibers as well. So that's how we chose our 10. And you can see in this three dimensional PCA data that our wollastonite fibers shown in yellow are actually very well separated from the other fiber types there. 
from our three asbestos fibers. So we're very clearly able to distinguish our asbestos fibers from the control sample. We can also look at this data in two dimensions as well. And you can see that there's five different clusters within this data. Again, our wool astonite fibers are well separated. And we can also see the actinolite fibers in green and the crocodilite fibers in blue. Our amosite fibers, though, separated out into two distinct groups. And again, this showed in the cluster analysis that we performed separately. When we did a little bit of digging into this, we discovered that amosite is actually present in two different forms. Uh, that's grunerite and comintonite. And the fibers that we'd been given, and we weren't told what type it was. So we strongly suspect that we were actually given a mixture of the two different fiber types. And that's what we're seeing here, separation out into its two distinct forms. Obviously, we would need to do um, quite a number of additional samples to be able to verify that hypothesis. So once we'd shown that we were able to identify these fibers within 2D cell cultures, we wanted to mimic a real sample. And in order to do that, we took 10 million cells and we pelleted them together. We spiked them with asbestos fibers and then we cryosectioned them to produce something that looked a little bit like a tissue section. And when you see the tissue section under the microscope, you can't actually see whether there's any fibers present because those fibers are well embedded within the tissue. I provided this sample to my PhD student as a, a blind sample, so I didn't tell him what type of fibers were present. When he did the analysis, he saw a range of fibers within the tissue. Uh, most noticeable, this long one here, which is about 120 microns in length, and also some smaller fibers as well. And from the elemental composition, he compared that to the previous data and was able to correctly identify that these fibers were amosite fibers in the blind sample. So to conclude, we can visualize fibers within laser ablation ICPMS data, even when they're embedded in the tissue and aren't visible to us under a microscope. We were able to clearly distinguish the asbestos fibers from a non-asbestos control sample, even in these complex samples. And there were actually signs that different types of asbestos can be differentiated from each other, although we would want to collect a larger data set in order to fully confirm this. I think there's more work that we need to do in this area as well. It took Callum a long time to process this data and to actually extract all the information from the images. So now we need to look at ways of automatically identifying fibers within our data to speed up this data processing. And we also want to consider what to do when you've got a variable background, because in real biological samples, our background can change dramatically within a tissue sample. So we need to do more work on that automation and on the removal of background from a complex sample. And that's what we're working on now. I'd like to end by acknowledging our collaborators, um, particularly the group at Sheffield Hallam University that have made the samples that we used in this work, and also to our industrial collaborators, new instruments and elemental scientific lasers that gave us early access to this prototype instrumentation. And finally, thank you. Uh, to the RSC for allowing me to speak today and thank you for your attention. Brilliant, thank you very much Amy. Um, again if there's any questions you'd like to, to ask Amy please do put them in the chat box. Um, we will now move on to our third speaker today and that's Mikhail Theroud from the University of Paris in France. Uh, Mikhail is an uh, analytical chemistry engineer with a specialism in ICPMS and based at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris. Um, my apologies for that pronunciation. Um, and it's been based there for the last um, 13 years. Um, the Institute is a higher education and uh, research establishment in the field of Earth, environmental and planetary sciences. At the moment, um, he's 
just completing his uh, PhD studies and today we'll be hearing uh, a little bit about some of that work um, based around the detection and characterization of nanoparticles utilizing um, time of flight um, mice spectrometry. Um, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this, particularly uh, with multi-elemental um, analysis. So um, I will pass um, over to you, Mikhail. Thank you. So at the moment we can see your presentation, but we can't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. There I'm we back. go, there we go. Brilliant. Is that okay? Can you see yes. you in my, in my screen? Yep, we can see your screen, we can see you on the video, we can hear you, lovely. That's perfect. Thank you very much for you, for this kind introduction. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I'm Michael Tarot from the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, and I'm working also at the Université de Paris. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is the identification of nanoparticles using single particle ICP time of flight mass spectrometry coupled to a clustering methodology. Uh, okay, obviously it's not working. Yep. Uh, so first, a little bit of context. As you may know, nanoparticles are uh, released into the environment uh, from multiple sources. And we can classify the, the nanoparticles based on three different categories. The first one, the natural nanoparticles, are basically coming from uh, natural activities, such as volcano activities or dust uh, storms. Um, the second one, incidental nanoparticles, are uh, them coming from um, uh, accidental uh, activities from, from human beings, such as metallurgy. And the last one uh, is called the engineered nanoparticles uh, that are purposely uh, produced from uh, human beings in order to improve the properties of some uh, products, such as in the cosmetic or in the food industries. Uh, what you also may know is that these nanoparticles are eventually ending up in aquatic systems. And so basically what we need uh, is to monitor the fluxes uh, of those nanoparticles for, for instance, for uh, biogeochemistry -ge studies or even for uh, health issues. Uh, the, the idea is actually to follow these uh, this, this fluxes is to have some dynamic techniques that are able to measure nanoparticles or nanometer uh, scales. And uh, as nicely uh, introduced by, uh, by Eduardo, single particle ICPMS is actually one of those promising techniques that is fitting all these requirements. And so that's why in our uh, one of our studies, we uh, try to determine the fluxes of titanium bearing nanoparticles in the Seine River watershed. Uh, and during this one year campaign, we uh, mainly focus on three different areas. Uh, those areas are influenced by uh, different land use. Uh, first one here that is influenced by the agriculture. Uh, second one is, that is mainly um, an urban area. And uh, the third one that is uh, a semi-natural area or a forest. And as you can see here, based on those numbers, uh, we can make the hypothesis that the land use is influencing uh, the, the fluxes of the nanoparticles. However, uh, based on the fact that we only have a, a sector field ICPMS, uh, the, this approach was only mono-elemental. So basically, we do not have any information about the total composition of the nanoparticle, and so basically about the source or even the transformation of those nanoparticles. So what we tried to do in, in another study is to determine the origin of the titanium bearing nanoparticle by in the, Soir, in the Loire River, sorry, uh, by combining two different approaches. A first one, uh, which is the single particle ICPMS, obviously, and a second one based on the measurement of the ratio of the total element concentration. Uh, so if we first focus uh, on the single particle ICPMS results, um, and this is uh, displayed here on this graph uh, by uh, showing this uh, red star here, and the size is related uh, to the concentration. So basically, uh, downstream, uh, upstream, sorry, uh, to Orléans, which is a sorry a city uh, 200 kilometers from uh, south from Paris. Uh, so uh, by focusing on the on this first location here, uh, we can see that the concentration of titanium bearing nanoparticles is, let's say, uh, relatively low. 
Um, and when there is an input here of the different of uh, an anthropogenic input, basically, because in, in this location number three, you have an outlet of a wastewater treatment plant. And here there is it's, this is an outdoor activity uh, center. So basically, when you have an anthropogenic input, we see that the concentration of uh, TI nanoparticles is increasing. And what we also see is that downstream of these uh, two different uh, areas, uh, the, on the location number five, the concentration of nanoparticle is decreasing. So that's why we, we try to correlate this to a different uh, elemental concentration ratio. And basically, when we focus on the titanium on vanadium and titanium on yttrium ratio, uh, we are able to see that on the location where the uh, concentration of nanoparticle is higher, uh, we see that the ratio of titanium on vanadium and titanium on, titanium on yttrium is increasing. And as vanadium and yttrium are uh, basically a tracer of geogenic background, we can say that, uh, or we can make the hypothesis that there is an, an input uh, of anthropogenic TI uh, and nanoparticle and not uh, natural nan TI nanoparticles. However, as I said previously in the as I said in the in the previous study, um, there is no information about the um, elemental signature of the nanoparticles. And as mentioned by Amy, uh, the fact is that using a sector field ICPMS, we do not have any information for of all the elements at the same time. So that's why we decided to uh, go for a single particle ICP time of flight mass spectrometry. And by applying uh, the single particle mode to uh, that kind of mass spectrometer, we are able to record uh, all the elements simultaneously. And basically, if we have a look here uh, on the, this uh, signal versus time graph, uh, we can see that we, differenti we differentiate three different particles, but we also see that we, different th we differentiate them based on their um, composition. Here, for instance, you have a pure gold nanoparticle, while here there is uh, a pure silver nanoparticle. And this one here in the middle is basically composed of both silver and gold at the same time. So this is very interesting. So that's why we uh, go for we went for uh, an instrument called Vites from New Instruments, um, and basically we used in the study uh, in the study that I will show uh, later um, this uh, setup, and we uh, particularly focused on these seven isotopes. However, before going for a natural sample directly, uh, the idea was to validate the methodology using model nanoparticles, such as those ones with different um, composition. And if we go directly for uh, the results of the bimetallic particles, uh, as you can see here on these TEM images, um, there is a core uh, of gold and a shell of silver, and as you can see here uh, also, um, and if we analyze uh, a suspension of those nanoparticles here uh, using single particle ICP TOF MS, and if we plot the result of the number of mole of gold versus the number of mole of silver, uh, we can see that they are the, the, the composition or the nanoparticle composition is following this nice line here, which is the reference molar fraction. And when we do uh, an average of the experimental molar fraction, we are able to see that the results are in quite a good agreement with the reference molar fraction. However, this is, um, let's say, a simple study, but the idea was to uh, go a little bit further uh, by analyzing three metallic nanoparticles. And is, in this case, we analyzed uh, two different suspension of nickel cobalt iron oxide and uh, here zinc cobalt iron oxide. You probably uh, have seen that in, the, in, in one of the previous uh, slides, but the nominal size was supposed to be 40 nanometers. And basically, even if there is some uh, effect of the TEM anal uh, analysis, uh, we can see here that the size of those nanoparticles is way bigger than 40 nanometers. And also, um, these um, nanoparticles were supposed to have um, an auto, uh, homogeneous distribution of the element inside them. However, as you can see here, for instance, there is some hotspots sometimes of nickel in these nanoparticles. And uh, in those ones, you can see a hotspot of cobalt here and a hotspot of iron. So basically, uh, the, the, the distribution of the element uh, into the nanoparticles is not uh, so homogeneous. 
However, we uh, took the uh, reference molar fraction given by the manufacturer. And uh, you can see here that there is uh, almost 67% uh, of iron, 17% uh, of cobalt, and also uh, almost 17% of nickel or zinc, depending on the, on the type of the nanoparticle. So we decided to analyze uh, those nanoparticles using single particle ICP TOF MS. And here uh, I plotted the uh, ternary, ternary diagram of the number of moles of cobalt versus the number of gold of iron. And you can see here on the right corner, nickel or zinc. And basically, by doing this kind of analysis, uh, it was quite surprising that uh, three different populations show up. A uh, first one with uh, iron, cobalt, and nickel. A second one with only iron and cobalt. And the third one, maybe you can't see it, it's over there, but uh, a third one with only iron that is detected. So when we go back to the result or to the chromatogram uh, displayed by Newcont, which is the software of VTES, um, we could see, um, and if, we add, if I add, sorry, the uh, limit of quantification of those three elements, which is roughly the same for the three selected elements here, um, we are able to distinguish the three different kind of nanoparticle, actually. The first one where uh, iron, cobalt, and nickel are way above uh, the limit of quantification. A second population here where uh, the mass of iron and cobalt is high enough to be uh, above the limit of quantification. And a second, a third kind of uh, nanoparticles where only iron or the, 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 yeah, the, the signal of iron is above the limit of quantification. And basically, this is due to the fact that uh, the, let's say, the mass of the first kind of nanoparticles is way higher uh, than the, the mass of the second type of, the, of nanoparticles, itself way higher than the mass of the third uh, category. So if we go back to our uh, ternary diagram uh, showing the cobalt, iron, nickel, and cobalt, iron, zinc uh, composition, uh, we calculated back the, uh, an experimental molar friction uh, for iron, cobalt, nickel, or zinc. And as you can see here, uh, those results are in perfect agreement with the reference molar fraction that was given by uh, the manufacturer. Uh, however, uh, it is, let's say, again, kind of, sim of simple uh, when we only have to follow one kind of uh, nanoparticles. So the question now is, what is the effect of mixing everything, let's say, uh, all together? And basically, we did a, a mixture of the B and 3 metallic nanoparticles that I showed you previously. And we also add uh, pure gold and pure silver uh, nanoparticles. And uh, actually, we end up with that kind of report. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, for human being, or at least for myself, <laughs> Uh, it can be time killing uh, and even subjected to, to errors to classify the nanoparticle by one by one uh, and to identify uh, uh, to which population they are belonging. Uh, so basically, the idea was to uh, do some clustering. Uh, so we decided to go for the hierarchical agglomerative clustering, which is a, a, a methodology that starts from the bottom saying that each observation, and in our case, each nanoparticle, uh, is its own cluster. And then it uh, iteratively agglomerates uh, the, the, the observation one by one uh, in order uh, based on their similarities. So here, for instance, we started with a number of uh, observation equal to 50, and then we finally end up with four different clusters. So in theory, it's uh, pretty interesting and, and very easy. But what is the result if we send uh, our results uh, in that, that kind of uh, clustering methodology? So after uh, the acquisition using the, uh, the ICP TOF MS, uh, we displayed here uh, the uh, molar composition, the molar fraction composition of each of the cluster that were found. And actually, it's kind of unexpected uh, to find uh, eight different clusters uh, when you mix five different kind of uh, nanoparticles. And, but what is 
interesting if we if we look further if we look more deeper in, into the, the the data uh we can see that uh, there is the five cluster that we are we were expecting and basically you see here the three metallic particles in cluster number two and three so zinc iron and cobalt and nickel iron and cobalt and what is more interesting is that um, the composition given by the clustering methodology is the right one. I mean, not the clustering methodology, but the single particle uh, TOF MS uh, is the right one. And here you can see also the bimetallic gold and silver nanoparticle. And basically, again, uh, the composition of uh, the nanoparticle in this cluster is in perfect agreement with uh, the one that was expected. And also the two, the two last one here are uh, pure gold and pure silver nanoparticles. But what was a little bit uh, less expected uh, it was the, these two different clusters here, cluster number zero and cluster number five, where we find only iron and cobalt and then iron alone. But as I said previously, if we focus here on the particle mass distribution of each of the clusters, we see that uh, in the three metallic cluster, cluster number three and two, uh, the, the medium mass of this cluster is around 50 um, femtogram, while in cluster zero, where we only distinguish iron and cobalt, the mass is five times lower. So basically it goes uh, with what I said previously is that when the uh, mass of the nanoparticle is decreasing, the ability for the time of flight mass spectrometer to uh, determine the whole composition of uh, the particle uh, is lower. And when we look at the uh, cluster number five here, the uh, medium mass uh, is basically way lower than the one that was expected in cluster number, uh, that was the, ah, sorry, <laughs> the one that was expected. Uh, and basically, uh, because the size is lower, the ability for the ICPMS to detect uh, the other elements uh, is again lowered. And finally, the last cluster, cluster number one, is not at all expected <laughs> because uh, it seems that in this cluster, uh, 17 particles were found with a, a strange, let's say, a composition with zinc, nickel, iron, and cobalt in it. Um, and basically, if you look at uh, the particle mass distribution, the, this, this distribution, uh, this medium mass, sorry, uh, is way larger than that was expected. So basically, we can um, maybe make the, the hypothesis that there is uh, a coincidence uh, in the nanoparticle arrival. So basically, we uh, obviously counted uh, one particle uh, that was aggregated, uh, uh, that was an aggregation. And if we look also to the cluster proportion here, we see that for this cluster number one, uh, the, it only represents one percent of the total um, composite of the total uh, number of particles. So basically, we can uh, say, let's say that it's uh, negligible. So we were quite happy, and uh, to finish and to to take on for the take on message, um, we can say that uh, as uh, Andre uh, Eduardo sorry said that the single particle ICPMS is very useful. Uh, for a single particle event, and basically it's also it's so so it's useful for the monitoring of the nanoparticle fluxes. However, uh, by using uh, a monoelemental approach, uh, we do not have any information about uh, the nanoparticle composition. Uh, so that's why a single particle time of flight mass spectrometry is more adapted in order to simulate simultaneously uh, monitor different elements at the same time and to uh, determine the nanoparticle fingerprint. However, since the amount of data is kind of huge, uh, it is important to couple this acquisition with a data treatment approach, uh, which is, let's say, more reliable and automatized. Uh, and the hierarchical agglomerative clustering is one of these uh, machine learning algorithms that is kind of useful in order to uh, do the nanoparticle identification. Uh, and as I said, uh, the, uh, the study is right now only focusing on model nanoparticles. So the next step is to analyze natural nanoparticles um, by using the single particle uh, ICP TOF MS, uh, then do some hierarchical agglomerative clustering and see if there is any uh, uh, information that we can uh, uh, retire from, from that. 
And uh, from a, a more a light uh, point of view, I'm going to present you all uh, the Parisian Vitesse, uh, which is uh, quite adapted to, to its new Parisian life, as you can see here. Um, and uh, finally, I'm going to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any question, uh, I will be more than welcome to answer. Thank you. <laughs> and it's uh, nice to see your Vitesse enjoying the, um, the pleasures of uh, French uh, cuisine. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much for that talk. That was um, really quite exciting. Um, and to, to hear about some of the, the challenges of moving towards um, real world analysis where you, you don't have these nice perfectly sphere gold nanoparticles. Things are more complex. The story is much more complex. So um, thank you very much for, for giving us a, a little insight into that and some of the, the challenges with handling that amount of data as well. Um, so yep, certainly any questions, please do pop those um, into the, the chat box. Um, and we'll move on now to our um, last speaker for today. And that's Professor Gavin Foster, who's an isotope geochemist from the School of Ocean and Earth Science from the University of Southampton, uh, which is based at the National Oceanography Centre. His research interests include using inorganic mass spectrometry applied to deep sea sediments to reconstruct past climates and to better understand and predict our future, uh, the, the effect of global warming and, the, and looking to the future. So today, um, Gavin's talk is entitled Getting More Information in Less Time Using Novel Segmented Ablation Technique and Time of Flight ICPMS to Investigate Elemental Zoning and I, I can't even pronounce that. I, I will leave the, the last part for you, Gavin. <laughs> I did not study Latin. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, let me just see if I can get this to mm -hmm. zoom to work up. Yeah, lovely. We can hear you and see you. Um, um, just pop you into you presentation Great. mode. You're ready to go. Perfect. Lovely. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. So thanks very much for that introduction and um, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, as Sarah said, I'm going to um, talk about how we can use time of flight um, ICPMS uh, and a novel um, segmented laser ablation technique to get some information about the elemental zoning in um, G. Seculifer, Globigerinids Seculifer, which is a foram or foraminifera. Here's a picture. Here's a picture of him um, um, here. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what forams are in a second. Um, let me just get a pointer up. Um, so yeah, this is work that we've done um, rather recently um, at the University of Southampton based at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton um, with uh, Andy Milton and, and, and uh, me who are based at Southampton and Phil Shaw and Lucas who are, at the, uh, who are based at New Instruments. And we've been using, as we've heard already today, using the, the new Vitess to do this. So um, just so to give you an introduction really as to why we're, we're bothering um, with this study, so foraminifera are um, single-celled protists. They live in the, um, throughout the water column and in deep ocean sediments and coastal sediments. And they're, um, they, the, the forms that I'm interested in are planktonic forms. These are pictures of some here. They're, they're sort of about, uh, um, up to about half a millimeter in size, and they form these chambered shells that are hollow. Um, shell walls are about 10 to 20 microns thick. And they, um, the planktonic ones swim around in the upper water column, make their shells out of calcium carbonate. Um, they, uh, they're voracious um, zooplankton. That they eat um, lots of other organisms that are floating around in the, in the upper water column. And some of them um, harbor symbionts as well, so dinoflagellate symbionts that live in the spines. Um, and why they're interesting is that they um, live in the surface water. They grow this calcium carbonate shell. And the calcium carbonate shell, the chemical composition and the isotopic composition of that calcium carbonate shell, or calcite shell actually, um, is a really good archive of past climates. So they, the composition and the, and the isotopic composition and the chemical composition reflects the environment in which they, in which they lived in. Um, and they die, um, they live for about four weeks. Um, so they, they live throughout the, throughout the year mainly. They live for four weeks of time with the lunar cycle. They then sink through the water column um, and accumulate on the seabed. Um, and they actually accumulate in vast quantities. What's shown here are um, in, blue, in blue 
are the areas of the ocean floor where you find um, calcareous ooze, which is just basically accumulations of this um, of these um, foraminifera, along with uh, with some with some mud and other terrigenous material from the continents. So to get um, to get our samples, we um, have a, a, a research crews aboard a ship like this with a with a, a drill rig on the back. This is a picture of the Joides resolution from the IODP. Um, to, hold on. The Joides resolution um, drops its drill, drill string into uh, kilometers of water um, and then drills hundreds of meters into the seabed, recovering um, a, a continuous core of, of sediment. And because the forearms are, are accreting layer by layer, we can look back in time as we, as we go down the core. Here's a picture of one of those cores. Um, the lighter colors are where you have more forearms. The darker colors are where we have more clay, but they're still forearm, forearm rich. You get a sample, scoop it out, wash off the mud, and then you're left with with hundreds and thousands of little forearms. Um, and you know this, we can recover sediments. If we go to the to the deep ocean, we can recover sediments that are up to about 120 million years old. So we have this continuous climate record over all that time, based on the chemical composition of the calcium carbonate, the calcite shells of these these foraminifera. So what we can use um, the forearms for is actually is the multitude of, of traces of past environment. Um, we can look at a number of um, chemicals that are in the, the, the calcite shells to reconstruct past ocean conditions. So in this case, we've got the magnesium content of the shell expressed relative to calcium um, because the calcium, because they're, they're made of calcite, the calcium is pretty constant, about 48%. So the, the magnesium to calcium ratio reflects the variation in magnesium. Um, and you can see that there's a strong relationship between the temperature which the foram grew and the magnesium calcium ratio. And we know this because we can go and fish for forams today. We can, we can work out what the temperature is that they grew in and uh, we can measure the magnesium content. So that gives us a good record of past temperature. So, you know, this is useful for predicting, it was useful for understanding how the climate changed in the past. Um, so we can, we can better understand how the climate might change in the future. Um, we can also look at other elements, such as the sodium content, and that tells us more about um, the past changes in the ocean composition. So we can see how the ocean composition, the salinity, um, and how the chemical makeup has changed through time. This is just a, um, a sort of limited example. There's really lots and lots of things that we can do with these forums um, and, and past uh, things that we can reconstruct in the past environment. Um, so when we're measuring um, the trace element composition of these foraminifera, um, I've expressed it here in a micromole per mole, but the really, this is sort of a hundreds to thousands of ppm level for magnesium um, down to uh, levels of about a ppm. For some for some of the other elements so that's the sort of range that we're interested in and because of that we run into problems where we get contamination from um, other sources um, or other other uh, other things in the sediments so when the forearms uh, sink through the water column they get coated with um, iron manganese oxyhydroxides especially when they're sitting at the top of the of the water column within the upper parts of the sediment column they start getting this, this coating with the iron manganese oxyhydroxides. And that actually is enriched in magnesium, but it's also very enriched in um, rare earths and other elements. So traditional methods using bulk dissolution of hundreds of shells, you do a, a, a reductive clean. You clean off this, this coating, which is laborious, and uh, you end up um, losing some of the, the forearm sample that you've separated and um, can actually change the, the, the uh, ratio in, a, in an unexpected kind of way. Um, so reductive cleaning is possible to so clean off these coatings. They also get full of clay because they're sitting in, in um, muddy sediments. Um, and you have to make sure that you, you, you shake off that clay using um, ultra, ultrasonic cleaning. Again, when you're doing these bulk, these bulk methods, because as you can see on here, this is a aluminium calcium ratio against the magnesium calcium ratio. Aluminium is enriched in the clay um, relative to the calcite. And you see this strong correlation, so it's really giving when, you, when, when the forearms are very dirty and full of clay, you get a, a bias magnesium calcium ratio. So another complication that's recently um, come to light that sort of limits um, how well we can reconstruct past climate is that there's a large um, intra, so that's um, um, within individual and between individual variability with it between the forearms. So what this, this is um, 
a plot from a recent paper that shows um, whole individual magnesium calcium ratio of a couple of different species, or actually the same species from a couple of different cores. Um, and you can see that in each individual, so this is taking a whole shell, dissolving it up and measuring it by standard ICPMS. You can see there's quite a range in magnesium calcium ratio from about two to, to six or seven, or two and a half or three to six, say, say. So if we go back to this calibration, three to six would be suggesting that the forearms are living at anything from 20 to 30 degrees, which is not true because we know they're all living at, at, at quite a narrow uh, uh, range. And this is just because of life processes um, changing the way in which magnesium is uptaken by the, by, the, by the organism. And that actually varies between different organisms, different individuals of the same species, I should say. So the average is, gives a meaningful correlation with the calcification temperature, but there's a lot of spread um, for the individuals. And, and part of that is down to the fact that when we look in detail, um, there's a lot of variability with, of magnesium within the shell. So this is um, a nanosims image through the shell wall. So I said that they're, they're about a millimeter, half a millimeter in size, and uh, the shells uh, are hollow, and the shell wall is about 20 or 50 microns thick. And so this is then a section through that shell wall, and you can see these bands of high and low magnesium. And actually the bands of high magnesium, are, if you, I'm not sure you can see that on here, but they can, they can be up to about 50, um, 50 micromoles, so it's about 10 times higher magnesium content than the, than the, the, the low the low parts. Um, but you can also see this banding in other elements like sodium. We're not really, really sure what causes it, but we think it's daily. Um, and, but it is probably related to, to how the organism is living, living its life, how it's, um, how it's making its shell and, and how it's using magnesium to control that, control that process. So bulk methods where we take forearms out of the sediment, um, dissolve them up, um, in their tens to hundreds using standard, clean them, put them to standard ICPMS. Um, gives us a good picture of average past climate and average over sort of thousands of years because tens of, um, tens of forearms are mixed, they, they, that number of forearms are all mixed up in the upper parts of the, of the sediment columns so that are averaged over, over time um, and they average over around about a thousand years. But each individual foram lives for about a month so within each individual forearm is the potential for a very high resolution climate archive um, that can be applied throughout the ocean and throughout the last 100 million years or so. So it's a really exciting possibility to be able to, to take a single forearm and try and get its, um, the temperature which it, which it lived because it gives us this really high resolution picture of past climate. But we really have to overcome um, these issues and understand the variability that's caused um, between individuals and, and within the shells. And to do that, um, we need a rapid approach to single forum analysis that gives us um, an insight into the variability within the, within the test wall at a speed that we can generate sort of population level information. Um, and just so far, the way, methods that are currently available to do this aren't necessarily up, up to the job. Um, we use uh, laser ablation ICPMS um, to do depth profiling is one way in which we can look at individual shells. In this case, you, you ablate from the outside in um, using a sector field ICPMS um, or a quadrupole ICPMS. Um, you're sort of limited to a, to a small range of, of, of elements because you don't want to have too big a mass range because you end up with those problems with transient signals. Um, also, the, the, the depth um, at which you're, you're ablating, turning that Turning time into depth is not necessarily straightforward. You're also losing information because you're just doing a profile. And, and actually, the, you tend to use a large spot, 30 microns or so, to get sufficient precision. Um, and um, you end up, that, that's actually losing a lot of spatial information. So you, you do get some idea that there's zoning within the, within the shell, but it, but it tends to be a bit, a bit smeared out. Um, another way of doing this is using electron probe. Actually, this is an electron probe image of the magnesium content. Um, you can see that this, this, this section of the shell looks very much like this, uh, this ablated profile. High on the outside, this sort of band of, of, of middle, middling enrichment. Um, electron probes are quite widely available. They're reliable. Um, they can be accurate and high resolution. But they're also limited in the elements that you can apply, magnesium to strontium. 
um, typically, and they tend to be quite slow. So you only see sort of portions of the of the um, shell mapped in this way. So it'd be quite hard to get um, large numbers of of shells mapped. And so a gold standard is nano sims, um, very high spatial resolution, good detection limits. Um, but you really, again, you're limited to the number of elements that you can that you can measure. It's quite slow. Um, and um, it's very expensive and actually access can be can be a little bit problematic to these big machines. So we turn to a new tool. Um, we've heard a lot about time of flight ICPMS already, so I won't, um, I won't uh, labor this. Um, but briefly, um, the advantages of, IC, of time of flight ICPMS is that is that you get full mass detection and very fast acquisition acquisition times. It's a really nice video that the guys at uh, new have provided. Um, what the main um, the main points here is that you have a, um, ions generated in the ICP, they um, make it to the push out region, and then the extraction uh, pushes um, uh, ions into the flight tube with the same energy, and then those ions travel through the flight tube um, at different speed depending on their mass to charge ratio. That then allows you to separate out the ions, and we've we've seen a few um, spectra that look like this already, and you get a full mass spectra in under thirty seconds. So um, like Amy, we coupled um, our Vitesse um, TOF to a laser ablation system um, to create 2D um, elemental maps. Um, Amy already gave a nice um, introduction to laser ablation. So very briefly, um, a sample, we shoot the sample with the laser. The laser's focused down to a couple of microns um, and that generates an aerosol that gets carried, gets carried into, the, into the ICP. Um, for analysis. Um, we get a cloud of aerosol generated every few milliseconds. You coordinate the, um, uh, the push out and the extraction of ions um, in the Vitesse with the, with the shots of the laser. Um, and because you drag the laser beam across the surface of your sample, you then um, are able to coordinate those and generate a 2D um, elemental distribution map. Um, and because we're looking at TOF, we can go from sodium up to up to uranium um, almost um, instantaneously. For those of you interested, um, we used a um, hydrogen helium reaction cell gas to remove um, argon and nitrogen based interferences. Um, full spectra from sodium to, to uranium, um, a baseline subtraction, and then these, these um, uh, 80 average spectra are then written to the hard drive. Um, the laser parameters were five micron spots. We moved the split stage at five microns per second. So it's slower than what we've seen um, previously today. We used a two volume cell with a, with a um, thin capillary to give us the, the best washout. And we used a 20 Hertz ablation rate. Um, we had to use these sorts of conditions because the, like I say, the, the variations um, are, are quite small that we're looking at, and we're actually looking at elements that are, that are PPM level um, within the, the, the test, the, sorry, the, the 4M shell. We calibrated using NIST glasses, um, and I'm going to present concentrations in, in PPM. So this is what we, um, during um, initial optimization, sort of maps that we were generating, a bit of a problem that we, that we noticed really was that there's a lot of area, because they're hollow, um, we mount the forearm so the forearm's like a, a a bunch of spheres we mount that in resin and then we polish through um, that resin to expose a cross section and so we get a good cross section of the wall um which is about in this case about 40 microns but there's a large area that's uh, that's just resin that we don't really want to measure don't really want to put loads of resin in the machine and and it's sort of wasting time so 40% of the area is no interest. And, and like I say, yeah, it's wasting time and cost. So um, Phil and Lucas came up with a method of, um, of segmented analysis where, where you get a combination of, of, of rectangles and that is then um, constructed together um, by, the, by the Vitesse to give you a sort of irregular laser ablation um, image. So you see that the rectangles are drawn on here and those are then combined together. That means we only use um, about half the time and we're really focusing in on the area of interest. So here, it's gonna cycle through a bunch of maps um, of all different types of elements. And I think what really um, has really impressed us with these um, images is that the, you get elemental information on all, all, um, all the elements in that, um, in that spectra. 
So you're getting things, um, information on elements that you wouldn't have even looked at, which I think is really useful. Um, but the elements that we are interested in um, are nicely uh, represented and we can and we start to see some some interesting features like here in the barium, um, lanthanum, cerium, lead, you've got this large lead spike on the outside. Okay, so to just talk you through some of this data, and I should say this has all been generated quite recently. Um, so we haven't had, uh, I think we can clearly see is the um, influence of clay contamination. I mentioned that they're sitting in the sediments and that clay contamination has uh, clay as high um, concentrations of the elements of interest and, that, and, and we want to sort of avoid the influence of that. So I'm showing you here sodium, magnesium, strontium, yttrium, barium and neodymium. And this is all um, imaged in the in the Vitesse's uh, new quant software. Um, so, oh, and yeah, and here's um, aluminium. Um, I should just say that this is varying from uh, thousands of ppm, so about uh, one and a half thousand ppm sodium to um, around about one ppm or sub ppm neodymium and uh, same with the barium. So aluminium, we see that the majority of the of the calcite of the foraminifera has got low aluminium. Is the outside of the shell is the inside of the shell and these areas that, that have got quite high aluminium. And this is probably bits of clay that's made its way into the inside of the test of the foram and uh, sticking to it. And you see that's associated with elevated sodium and, and magnesium and, and neodymium. So if we're going to do any analyses, we'd want to make sure we avoid um, screen out these high aluminium parts. Um, manganese, like I say, as they're, as they're falling through the water column, they get coated in um, ferromanganese, part of, uh, ferromanganese uh, coating. And that their ferromanganese coatings enriched in, in rare earths, enriched in um, in this case, the, the manganese is very much enriched on the inside of the foram. And uh, similarly, the neodymium is enriched in the on the inside and on the outside, sort of co coincident with the manganese. So it's most of the neodymium we're measuring in this foram is associated with the manganese coating. Same can be true to a certain extent of yttrium. And then there's questions really about how much this magnesium enrichment in the inside of the test is related to the man uh, manganese coating um, as opposed to actually in the, in the foram. But actually, if you look, the, 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 there is a distinction and the magnesium is high um, within the early parts of the, of the inner parts of the shell. Okay, so very briefly now, because I can see I'm running out of time. Um, um, what can we use this sort of data for? Well, one thing we can do is get insights into the, the way in which the foram test, so that's the shell, the foram shell is constructed. So one model <coughs> um, illustrated in this paper by Jen Farenbacher is that the foram puts all its chambers down and then thickens them um, with time. And in which case, you, every chamber, you'd expect to have the same banding patterns in, in mag uh, magnesium, for example. What we see in this foram, which is a different species to this one, um, this is a, uh, a deutatri, this is a, a secudifer. Um, you can see that the, the different chambers have got different banding patterns. So that sort of suggests that this is not the way in which the, this foram, uh, this secudifer is, is precipitating its shell. Like I say, it's early data, and, but, but this technique really holds um, a lot of potential for us to, to get a lot more information about uh, how forams form their shells and how we, how, and that helps us um, it will improve our reconstructions of past climate. Okay, so to summarize, trace elements in foraminifera are an important tool for reconstructing past environment and climate. Um, analysis is complicated by contamination and uh, life processes associated with how they make their shells. We need this tool that's capable of um, in, uh, resolving the intra-test variability and rapidly enough to generate population level information. So how does each individual do it and do they do it differently? Um, and it uh, looks like LA TOF um, has got the detection limits um, and the full suite of elements is really advantageous. And the segmented imaging um, looks like we can get some rapid elemental imaging of irregular shapes like foraminifera, but probably applicable to all sorts of different um, um, applications. I see I've gone over a couple of minutes. Sorry about that. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Gavin. Um, definitely learned a lot about forum uh, forums today. Um, just to say um, thank you very much to all of our speakers um, for four wonderful talks in four very different areas, um, but seeing how 
um, atomic spectroscopy techniques can be used in such diverse ways and such kind of new and innovative ways as well. It's um, been really fascinating for me to hear today. Um, we do have a few minutes um, left in our time slot um, before we get kicked off of Zoom. Um, if any, uh, if we do have any other outstanding questions, um, I will ask my glamorous assistant Jackie if she has uh, received any other questions. Hi, Sarah. No, not at the moment. People are. Hey. Hi there. They're answering questions themselves at the moment. So that's um, all done. Everyone's answered. Okay. Um, I do have one um, that came through um, directly to me, but uh, in directing a question to um, uh, Mikhail, actually. I'm just, I've now lost it though. It's, let me just bring up the window. Um, so it's a message uh, to Michael. Um, in a previous paper by, uh, who is that? Uh, oh, Kamya Mirabi uh, sent the question and basically asking in one of their previous papers on hierarchical clustering of single particle ICP um, TOF MS, they corrected for the heteroparticle coincidences. Um, do you consider this as a way to make sure that your clusters are real and not an artifact of coincidence? Actually, I guess he, uh, he, Kamia, thank you for the question, Kamia, but uh, I guess he's talking about the, the, the cluster where uh, I suppose that the, the particle are uh, uh, an aggregate. Um, basically, um, we, didn't, we didn't think about that because the idea first was to show or to display everything that we measured. Um, and also there is, a, let's say, a, a difference between the machine that we are using and the machine they are using is that um, we are uh, on, the, on the Vitesse, we are continuously measuring um, elements at all at the same time. And we are, uh, and we are doing this by using um, very, very small dwell times. And there is no accumulation of dwell times uh, in order to, to show the different distributions. Uh, so basically, the coincidence um, in terms of uh, number of particles is drastically um, decreased uh, doing that kind of, uh, of a really fast and continuous acquisition. Is that okay? Um, I have actually um, just allowed um, our participants and um, attendees to unmute their microphone. So if um, there are any kind of follow-up comments or questions, um, do feel free to, to unmute yourself. And certainly if there are any other questions to any of our other um, speakers today, please do feel free to, to unmute and, and um, uh, ask your question. I saw there was a thumbs up that came from Kamya, so I think he was happy. <laughs> Good. If there are, um, does anyone else have any other kind of questions or comments they would like to, to put forward to our um, speakers today? Um, I have a question for Amy. Um, how, um, sh how big could the shortage be in the like th trans therapeutics time by ident how, how much sooner could we identify it based on current um, times um, with the imaging that you, you've been doing? Well, the, the disadvantage that we have with laser ablation is that it's a destructive technique um, and we can't perform it in vivo. Um, so the work that I've been doing really has been on um, ex vivo samples. Um, so it's, I think I would say that the technique's useful in research, in research labs. Um, when you've got post-mortem samples and you want to understand why the person developed um, the condition, then it is, is very useful, but I, it's not currently um, and wouldn't be able to be used in screening. What we're hopeful though, is that by looking at these fibers in the, uh, in the LA ITPMS data and being able to correlate that data to other techniques like MALDI where we're picking up biomarkers, that we might be able to then identify what individuals will be at greater risk of getting mesothelioma um, and kind of use it in that sense for earlier identification rather than actually using the, the technology um, to perform this this imaging in people. Okay, thank you. I 
I think certainly the what I've taken away from all of the talks today is just how much data can be generated with these techniques and, and I think that was almost a, a common theme across all of the presentations today and um, and and I think Mikhail's talk in particular kind of highlighted the, the use of these advanced statistical techniques to um, for, for data processing and being able to pull out these additional um, bits of information, additional trends and things that you didn't see when you kind of first looking there. So um, I really think uh, moving forward, that's going to be something that's that will play a, a bigger part in our research. If there are no other questions um, or any other comments, um, I would just like then just to wrap up to say thank you very much to our speakers once again. And um, thank you to you, all of the attendees and joining us today. I hope you've um, thoroughly enjoyed today as much as I have. Um, our next event is going to be E for early career. So we'll be inviting uh, speakers uh, in the early stages of their research career. And we're looking to hold this um, towards the, the end of September. We, we haven't got a date as yet, but looking towards the end of September. So we will keep you all updated. And um, once again, thank you very much for your time today and hope to see you at our next event. Thank you very much.